Welcome back to <gasps> The Matrix and welcome to the Bro Cannon Rap Party. It's season two, we're done, year two. 50 episodes, 50 billion episodes of this. And you know what's maddening? I still feel like I haven't dipped my toes into the madness of Doctor Who mythology at all. How long is this going to keep going? Am I going to be 75 years old talking about dogmen on the internet? I mean, yeah, that actually does sound very in character. Doctor Who or no Doctor Who. But as a special treat, I decided to use all the Kofi money that's been tipped to me over the past year and commission some help from my favourite online digital artist, Lofi at LaFile Arts. So everything you see in this video is her. Oh my god. The illustrations for these facts are wonderful. Matrix, generate us the good stuff. Over 50 episodes, 200 plus facts, and we've never gotten round to the Sarah Jane adventures. Recently, I found all the audiobooks online. <clears throat> Purchased responsibly back in 2008. There are some absolutely wild stories in here. She heard Clyde busy bragging to his friends about a scheme to spy on the girls' changing rooms. You can imagine Maria's reaction to that. And once Clyde had finished backing away in alarm with his hands guarding his vulnerable areas, he quickly justified himself. I'm not being a perv, he protested. In these, the Banman Road Gang end up battling computer viruses, evil antiques, and wolf aliens and a loving homage to Hound of the Baskervilles? But the absolute wildest is the tenth and final story, Judgment Day, written by Scott Gray. Ah, that explains it. Banman Road, 2011. An alien species beams down to Earth, invading a local car park called the Veritas. <laughs> yeah, they even look a little bit like the monks. The Veritas are an ancient force for justice. Searching for anybody who does not tell the truth and meeting out painful, harsh judgment. Come to Earth to bring the planet's biggest liar to justice. And this person, no, no, not you, is apparently Miss Sarah Jane Smith. I mean, hey, she is a journalist. Oh, come on. Operating from Manman Road, having to deny the existence of aliens? has apparently racked up and Sarah Jane Smith is on the Veritas's naughty list. It's boggling to me. There are people on the planet Earth who aren't who they say they are, who live every single day as a lie. Sarah Jane, all credit to her, is running a massive alien fighting operation from her attic. If any old kid stumbles into it, Sarah will be pretty open and say, yeah man, Slitheen, aliens. Here, take this acid, throw it on their face. <laughs> She is liable to the odd cover-up, getting Mr. Smith to change the story in the press. But I insist there is much, much worse than this do-gooder. And it's hilarious to me that <laughs> these arbiters of justice, this ancient form called the Veritas, need to be told that sometimes there's such thing as a good lie. Absolutely adorable. It's very fitting for a kid's show, but it makes a broad generalization about the whole verse. And those are my speciality. There's a lot going on in this story. Uh, Rani and Clyde are being harassed by a, a stage magician. Whereas Sarah Jane and Luke are being shouted at in a parking lot by these new aliens taking the moral high ground. Apparently the Veritas are so powerful, they can fix all the changes made by her lies. They undo Sarah Jane Smith's impact on the world in seconds. All of this power! And they watch on as the human race goes mental with the knowledge of alien invasions and the paranoia of the next attack. Don't you see? I was only lying to protect the humans. And they listen to her and they change their mind. The power of a god bestowed on a species with a child's sense of judgment. You just failed a morality test for toddlers. Instead, the Veritas decide that the second most guilty person on Earth of lying is the stage magician, the great Zando. So then they have to explain to the aliens why he isn't lying either. It's, it's just magic, isn't it? It's just entertainment, guys. Please, dear God, I hope these aliens do not discover cinema or the theater, because then I think the human race is done for. They won't understand. Why are all these people lying to us? And that's the final Sarah Jane story. 
Such an adorable child's fable. That's what Sarah Jane is for. There's a really nice send-off. A tribute to her character. Where we see Sarah Jane writing the cover stories for dinosaurs invading London, or the Loch Ness Monster destroying oil rigs. You find out that Sarah Jane Smith's entire life has been covering up the Doctor's tracks. And sometimes, doing a much better job than he does. Oh, look at that. Fact number two. River and Javik. Sorry, Javik, I meant Captain Jack Harkness. <laughs> yeah, this was a fun one. It may have become harder to root for Captain Jack Harkness in recent years, but not even John Barrowman's egomaniacal midlife crisis can ruin Jack for me. <laughs> no matter what you say or what you do, they still love me! Late career Jack past Miracle Day is just a washed up sad loser and my favourite iteration of the character. The scapegoat fool guy for some of the universe's darkest stories and unfair tragic fates. The Jack portrayed here by James Goss and John Barrowman is one of my favourite fictional characters ever and I'm so disappointed we won't be exploring more of that in the near future. One such example of this man's tragic, just awful life is his involvement with River Song. River may get everywhere these days from here, here and here, but River isn't making like a quick tortured cameo in this. She's more like um, Jack's reason for living. <laughs> get ready to hear Jack appropriately simp like never before without crossing any inappropriate legal moral barriers. From ancient battles to eternal wars, a pair of time-crossed lovers take the stars. It turns out that due to a bunch of timey-wimey encounters, Jack Harkness and River Song have known each other for longer than either of them have known the Doctor. And that's pretty wild. The two just keep popping in like a screwball comedy, doing the whole Doctor River meeting out of order romance on fast forward. And in my opinion, better than Moffat did it. Whoa, high praises today. For instance, did you know that River Song named Jack? Accidentally calling him Captain Jack Harkness? Boom, bootstrap paradox. I'm gonna call myself Jack Harkness now. River first met Captain Jack as a little girl, like just mere moments after she regenerates at the end of Day of the Moon. He picks her up, takes her off the street, looks after her, it's adorable. In return, River Song starts showing up all across the Rusty Davis era. Blitz London. Boomtown. <laughs> River fuels the TARDIS up in Boomtown when the Doctor's out on his Slovene date. River Song is jealous of Margaret Slovene. And then in Series 3, River pops into the Valiant to give Jack a hacksaw. Hey River, you think you could like... Help out. Hurry things along a bit. I've been tortured for a year. But it's not all just fan service. You start getting a real kind of kinship between the two. As River tells him about this man she loves. Whilst the two clearly have romantic, deep chemistry. Jack is unknowingly giving River relationship advice for the Doctor. And Jack's in love with both of them. Isn't that the most tragic, pathetic thing you've heard? So in a series of space-time dates, they ride a Triceratops. They go and help Jackie Tyler wash a duvet. They attend the face of Bo's funeral. Jesus, is he still not worked it out? And they go to prank Oswald Pink. Shall we go and... Bang on his door? And give him the fright of his life. <laughs> <laughs> the knocking they hear outside and listen. That's Jack and River teasing Orson Pink, giving him a traumatic breakdown. Jack also says that in the other direction, there's an ancient immortal waiting to play chess. There's very few people this could be other than a shielder, hanging around in hell bent, implying, and these aren't my words, that Oswald Pink is stranded on Gallifrey. That's a, uh, mmm, that really changes that story. And sorry, just how mad is all this? 
James Goss is a genius, don't get me wrong, but I feel like he's being made to pump out all these big finished stories so fast that there's nobody on quality check who can tell him no. They can't keep up with the man. And are we thinking these two very sexually charged beings do not, do not hook up? But eventually we arrive on Derillium, where River bumps into. <laughs> what a surprise, you're here, Jack. Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm not stalking you. I'm not stalking you. And it's here, realizing that River Song's husband is Peter Capaldi, that she finally, gently lets him down. Mere seconds before she goes to join the Doctor on the balcony. <laughs> he's right there. In this scene, he's right there. Thank God we were spared the awkward version where the Doctor spots him and makes eye contact. All in all, this story takes such a weird concept as Jack and River are lovers and convinces me that it's a better romance than she shares with the Doctor. I don't know how he quite did it. Ah, you can't change your DNA, Melody. Though in some ways, maybe she dodged a bullet. They still love me. Fact number three. All right, so this one's just about sphinxes. <laughs> you mind if I talk about sphinxes for a bit? The sphinxes are probably the strongest gods in the Hooniverse. Yes, they were an actual species that existed before the Dark Times. Living creatures of magic who lived on Earth? <laughs> I think forget Faction Paradox. Forget Iris Wild Time. The strangest Wilderness Years edition, the most fun one, are the fact that the kings of space are giant sphinxes. Ah, oh, God, Sphinx Space. Uh, Sphinx Space is an area of the galaxy controlled by the gods a bunch of giant lions flying around the place. In Faction Paradox, the evil renegade, <clears throat> the master, supposedly took slaves into that area of space and waged a one-man war on the great gods, who, in this instance, in this verse, apparently are sphinxes. So why don't we hear about them more? Well, actually, we kind of do. Ten and Donna battled a sphinx person when they teamed up with Jason and the Argonauts. Shot dead. There's the Sphinx of Thule, an ancient creature, the most powerful augurer in the nine corners of the universe. Right, so just the strongest thing in the universe then. This villain took over galaxies, controlled minds, and worse, spoke entirely in riddles. Eventually it was slayed by the Gallifreyan hero Pridonius, who took its head back to the archives for study. The Sleeping Beast! You know the Great Sphinx, one of the fucking wonders of the world? It's a Doctor Who villain. That very same Sphinx was put there by the Kryptolians, a bunch of aliens whose evil plan was to plant billions of leonine stone robots. Huh? Sure, okay, I've heard worse. Basically planting killing machines to overthrow whatever species evolved around them. And there's a ton. There's Sphinx statues left in Egypt, Atlantis, and Mars. Relegated to non-sentient stone statues. But uh, also, uh, depending on who you believe, I guess, the Asirans built the one in Egypt. You can't both claim the same villain plan, guys. But the funniest example is in the Missy book. Look at her up there. Cut to Missy, who has tracked one down in the middle of 19th century London. There's still a little bit of life left in this lion statue. Now, despite going to war against the Sphinxes in a previous possible maybe form, Missy decides, naturally, to free this god and let it loose upon London. Using a blood ritual. <laughs> she woke up an inert god and only then thought, ah, hang on, that's actually quite dangerous. So yeah, God lived on Earth, and the gods were giant sphinxes. Because, you know, anything that our culture didn't make was probably... Probably aliens, right? I'm sad to say, all the sphinxes disappeared back in the olden days. Rassilon and company hunted down anybody who used sorcery. They had to make a nice rational world, so there was no place for witches and sphinxes. <laughs> the dark time sounds wild, and we never get to see the fun stuff. So they swapped their magic for technology and became endangered stone statues. To me, that makes total sense. 
Ah, look at those drawings. I feel honored. I want to put them up on my wall. I command you to check out Lofi's portfolio and Twitter page. All links will be in the description. Absolutely blown away by these. Not everybody would be so chill with asking to put a Victorian dressed woman on top of a flying sphinx. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's no reference for that. And that brings us to another good year of Broke Cannon. Check out the playlist and I'll see you in time for Christmas.